our public, is to have a professor chair or mediate or facilitate a discussion in class on indigenous issues and they don't know the issues themselves. Because then how do you mediate? How do you talk? How do you know when what you're actually talking about is not even factual? And when you're doing more harm than good? And these are the kinds of questions that you know, we often ask ourselves. Um, the relationship. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big person for action. I'm not big on a whole lot of talk and, and talking about the relationship all the time. But I think in this scenario, talking about the relationship is important because you have to know the facts behind it. So how did we get to where we are? What is the current relationship that we have between Indigenous peoples and the crown? And I should have warned you, I do use subliminal messaging. <laughs> I don't think I want to know any more. Those pictures were horrific. 
I don't want to see kids without any running water. But we have an obligation as Canadians to know more. And then if you decide not to do anything, then you've made an informed choice. But I think we at least owe it to Indigenous peoples just to know what's happening. What are the current realities? Are all First Nations chiefs corrupt? Is that a reality? <coughs> How many people have the facts? Done the studies, done the research. These are the kinds of things, when you're in a university, either, that you should be thinking critically. Don't trust anything your professor says unless they can back it up. And even when they back it up, check the source, because it could be Tom Plank. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean, it could be an academic. <laughs> it's never justified in any society for anyone to be suffering, regardless of the fact that it's indigenous peoples. There's just no justification. So open your so know your history, open your eyes to the realities, and number three, and this is the tricky one on solutions, what Indigenous peoples have asked for are respectful allies. We don't need saviors. No heroes, no person who has the magic solution to everything, because every time this happens, what happens? We end up with things like residential schools, right? That's the solution to our subhuman status. What's the solution to our poverty today? Let's just get rid of all reserves. That'll fix them, right? You'll be like everybody else. Well, who's everybody else? There's a large number of homeless people in this country. There's a rising number of impoverished children in this country. Who says I want to be like everybody else? These are the kinds of things I want people to think about. Avoid savior syndrome at all costs. I'll show you pictures of some of those saviors after. So how many times, and, I, and I've already asked this, how many times have you heard someone say they should just get over it? One group suffered at the hands of Canada. They got money in their fund. Another group suffered in Australia. They got an apology. They're all fine now. Why can't Indigenous people just get over it? That was ancient history. And so like I said, just tell me that you know what the it is, and then let's talk about the reasoning behind it. Because the it, the it is the, is the most important part of this conversation. What is the it? Well, we're talking about the relationship here tonight. How did we get here? And here's our cap history in 10 seconds. We've essentially had a relationship that went from nation to nation, to wards of the state, to an Indian problem that needs to be dealt with. The problem with those three stages is that we're still at the third one. We're still in Indian problem mode. And policy, Indian policy, and I call it that because that's what they still call it internally at uh, Indian Affairs and Justice Canada. This Indian problem hasn't gone away. It didn't do all of the things that they had expected it would do. Right? Scalping laws only decimated 80% of the Mi'kmaq population. Or Chief and I wouldn't be standing here tonight. It wasn't all heck because they didn't do it. Right? And these are really important factors to consider. Indian policy has been very specific, very targeted, was not an accident. The historical and internal cabinet documents and records clearly show they had large numbers of policy advisors, lawyers, uh, theologians, all thinking about this problem and how to deal with the problem. And so these plans aren't haphazard. They're very, very particular and they're very targeted. So what was Indian policy based on? Well, you know what it was based on. It was the problem problem that you had to get rid of. That was the superintendent of Indian Affairs. I have people, when I speak in other countries, who say, well, no, 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 that, that can't be true, because anyone who's a minister of Indian Affairs, wouldn't they be your chief advocate? Wouldn't they be the ones actually standing up for your rights? It's like, not in this country, folks. And it's a very hard concept for countries without Indigenous populations to understand, because they haven't had to. Two primary objectives of Indian policy over time. One, to acquire indigenous lands and resources. 
the single, probably single most important objective of Indian policy. Number two, to eliminate financial obligations towards the remaining Indigenous populations. Those were the two primary objectives. You can find them in any history book. But their primary method of doing that has been referred to as assimilation, when in actual fact it was a combination of elimination and assimilation. Elimination talks about the physical removal of Indigenous peoples. Assimilation is talking about culture, language, political status, legal status. And those are two very different things. Indian policy, for anyone who doesn't know, was based on problematic assumptions. Why? Because they were works of fiction. One, that Indians were this big race, a biological race of people that you could measure with science. This is the science of biology. You know, if your forehead looked as, uh, measured a certain way, then you were more Indian than not. They also had other tests, blood tests, drowning tests, fire tests, pencil tests. If they stuck a pencil in your hair and it fell out, it was straight enough to be an Indian. If it stayed in, there was a chance you probably weren't Indian and you potentially came from Africa, so you're out. Really, it sounds ridiculous, but these, this is what the leading thinkers of the day have based Indian policy on, and it hasn't changed over time, because the Indian Act still contains a blood quantum formula. Today, in this very day and age. The other assumption was that we were subhuman. But that worked for a very particular purpose. It allowed you to justify all of the atrocities, but just take that aside for a minute. There's a legal principle for any of the law students in this class. It's called terra nullius. If you arrive on a piece of territory and there's no human beings running around, you get to claim it. So, whoops, I see nations of people here. They're all subhuman. This land is mine. So there's very particular reasons. Not all of this stuff happened by accident. The other problematic assumption they made was that we were all dying off and that there was a fixed end date when we would no longer be here and of course we cost too much. So then what do you do about that if you have all of those problems? Well the policies that they developed <coughs> reacted to all of those assumptions. So if we're dying off then the planning was all short term. We were not expected to be here today. The funding was chronically and purposefully reduced. So the rations given to people who lived on reserves and who weren't allowed to leave by law, the rations were at 60 to 80 percent of what the entire community needed to survive. Do that math. How can a community survive? It can't. Right? So they created situations of poverty and starvation. No input from the actual Indians because they're not human, so they wouldn't have an opinion. The other thing about the Indian Act, and this is a copy of a pass, so if you wanted to leave the reserve, you had to get a pass from the Indian agent, it's up to them. But the other thing about the Indian Act is that they always contain formulas in there to breed out the indigenous populations. And where they got their breeding formulas were from the breeders of horses and dogs back in Europe. They mirrored them formula for formula. That's why we have only 750,000 indigenous people or, uh, registered, recognized Indians in this country, instead of the more than double number that actually exists. And what was the ultimate objective? Every time an indigenous scholar says the ultimate objective is known as the final solution, the media go crazy. All the all the commentators go crazy saying. Wow, now you're referring to things that happened overseas. You're trying to make irrational comparisons. And I'm not doing no such thing. I'm actually quoting the superintendent of Indian Affairs. They knew what they wanted. The fact that 40% of the Indian children were dying in residential schools, and in some schools 70% or more, was no reason to change that policy. Why? Because they had a final solution was to get rid of all the Indians. This was not an education policy gone wrong. Every time I hear that, I just want to 
jump up and down. Um, because this, what is the good intention of that? I don't see any good intention. And I'm sure there were good people at the time. But that's not a good intention. When you're talking about the solution of the, you know, the, the final solution of the Indian problem, you have to take into account not just residential schools and the deaths that occurred. The scalping laws, which almost completely wiped out the Mi'kmaq population and did wipe out other indigenous populations. The smallpox blankets, which International Medical Association has called biological warfare, kind of the beginnings of biological warfare. Forced sterilization that in some communities, 60% of all childbearing age little girls and women were forcibly sterilized without their knowledge and without their consent. In northern communities, it all but wiped out some of their communities. Children as young as 12 years old would go in with a stomach ache and come out sterile. How many people in this country know that history? When it started and when it ended? And what the populations might have looked like? Aside from the rations, the uh, conditions of poverty, if you add all of that up, the most conservative estimates about what our original populations were show that 90% of our population was wiped out from these policies, laws, and actions. It worked. They were able to achieve what they wanted to do. But this is part of the hard facts we don't want to hear. When we talk about treaties, we want to hear that treaties were about peace and friendship and we're all going to get along here and I won't bug you and you won't bug me and we'll work together. How were those treaties signed? Sometimes you hear in the media that some of the uh, indigenous nations who are, belong to the numbered treaties deny that they ever surrendered their land. And you say, oh, that's just sour grapes. They don't like the deal that they made. Really? Because in order to get some of those treaties, they forcibly made these people get drunk, changed the wording by the governor's express orders. So made sure that what they told them during treaty negotiations and what was reported was not what was in the actual treaty. So when you say, hey, it's in the treaty, what's wrong with you? What are you complaining about? Um, that. But it got worse. For the people in the Maritimes and in New England, they made sure to set those big dogs on them. They used to stone them so hard that they lost their limbs. This couldn't have happened in Canada. Yeah, it did, folks. But you won't hear that in any treaty commercials. Because we want to believe the myth. When we say we're all treaty people, you want to be a treaty person? Is that the history that you even know about when you say, I'm a treaty person? We have to know that to understand what are the grievances. When we can't agree at the treaty table, why is it? The government knows. That's where we get all this information. But the public doesn't know. The public doesn't understand. They think we just want money. Or we're just being contrary. Or we're not negotiating in good faith. But there's some reconciliation to be had here. And it's not shaking hands. People need to know about what's happening.
So technically, we were in trouble. It's a good thing no one knows our history <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> but um, my question is, what, what has changed? In case you're wondering, these are just some of the words. sterilizations to control populations. What do we have now? We have premature deaths caused by the chronic purposeful underfunding in these communities. Lack of housing, lack of clean water. We actually have deaths every year in First Nations communities of contaminated water. Seriously? In Canada? We used to have residential schools. Then it became the 60s school. And I'm assuming most people have heard of that. That's where we social workers went into communities with buses, school buses, and took out full school buses of children and permanently adopted them out because they thought that we weren't capable of taking care of our own children. What about the Western education system that was forced on our children in residential schools? Didn't allow us to speak our languages, didn't teach us any of our history or culture, only taught us European education. What's happening in public schools today? Has anything changed? I don't know my Mi'kmaq language. I can say a few bad words, which is why I didn't say them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, th and that's a problem. That's a problem that my kids are speaking their language. I have got to do something about that. But the education system, with few exceptions, fundamentally hasn't changed. So when you hear calls from First Nations, about their own education systems. Jurisdiction over education, there's very critical reasons why. Because even if you have the best teacher in the world, and on Mi'kmaq <coughs> Street Week, you get to take field trips and learn about Mi'kmaq people, all the Mi'kmaq people that go in those officer schools have the other 51 weeks of the year that they don't learn anything about themselves. Kind of doesn't feel like they have a spot in this country. Scalping laws, no longer on the books. But we have Starlight Tours. Anyone know what Starlight Tours are? Police pick up Indians, drop them off somewhere in a remote location with no shoes or boots, in sub-zero temperatures, where they freeze to death. That happened in the recent past, and not one, not two, not three isolated incidents. We're not just talking about a Robert Pickman scenario. We're talking about a de facto policy of treating Indians like they don't have the right to exist. <coughs> what about the laws that used to be under the Indian Act that prevented Indigenous peoples from gathering, from celebrating, from hiring lawyers? Lawyers could go to jail if they helped Indigenous peoples. Those aren't on the books anymore, but the funding for legal services has been cut. CSIS, d and the RCMP, and now INAP, Indian Affairs, surveils a large number of Indigenous peoples, monitors all of their activities, and I'm one of them. Is that paranoia? No, I made an ATIP request and asked for the documents. I got thousands of pages of what they monitor, when, and how. Over-carceration in prisons. It's not a problem that's declining. The fastest growing prison population in this country is Indigenous women, and it's expected in the next five years to increase by 130%. So those of women who haven't had all of their children taken away and put in child and family services, the rest of them, well, they risk being thrown in jail and losing their children that way. We have a very big problem in this country with the relationship and all of these policies, or de facto policies. It may not say in Child and Family Services policy, let's try and take all these kids. Just like applying for a police officer job used to say you had to be six feet tall. It didn't say anything. But we know how to make policies do what we want. They're very strategic. <coughs> the other problem, which I have uh, the biggest problem with, is the brute force that is used when Indigenous peoples do try to advocate on their own behalf. About what? Not because they want billions of dollars, not because they want to be the Prime Minister, not because they want to take over Parliament. Not 
Latin because they want all the land back. But they want sacred ceremonial sites protected. They want enough land for the people to live on. Nobody is saying everyone else has to come home. But if you, if you think about the reserve lands today, 0.2% of all of the lands in Canada are reserve lands. It's a fifth of 1%. Yet, we're 4% of the population. It's not even on a per capita basis justifiable. But when you consider that some First Nations have 26,000 band members, how on earth do you expect them to fit into tiny parcels of land? It doesn't seem as ludicrous then when you look at land issues and why people are fighting so hard to protect their lands. Some people are just trying to survive. But the other thing about Indigenous territories is that it's part of our identity. You just can't be a Mi'kmaq person without Mi'kmaq Mi'kmaq territory. There has to be those connections. Over-incarceration has been called a crisis in this country by the Supreme Court of Canada, by the Office of the Correctional Investigator, every year for the last 15 years. Calling it a crisis, calling it Canada's shame. I didn't even see that in the media. How many people know how many people are over incarcerated? Every single justice inquiry that's been done in this country has concluded not only are Indigenous peoples more likely to be arrested than other people? So no discretion there. More likely to be prosecuted, more likely to be jailed, more likely to be denied appeal. And they also get the honor of being more likely not to have access to any of the rehabilitation programs and services in jail once they're there. And the housing problem that currently exists, the crisis, Harper's answer, build more prisons. Exactly, because who is the fastest growing, fastest growing population? It's indigenous peoples, and these things don't happen by mistake. Part of addressing current realities, though, is addressing all of the myths and stereotypes. I just pulled that from the media in the last two weeks a variety of media, right? All First Nations are corrupt. That actually came from a conservative senator. <coughs> or they nameless. <laughs> all chiefs are millionaires. They all live high on the hog while the people suffer. They get everything for free. They're a burden on the taxpayers. They just really need to get over it. Or, I did. I had a hard childhood. I pulled up my socks. Why isn't everybody else? Because we're all the same. Let's talk about alleged corruption. <laughs> <laughs> the actual corruption level, if you can even call it corruption level, they did a study. They looked at all of the audits from all of the First Nations across the country. Uh, and looked at all of the areas in which INAC had to, or the RCMP had to investigate, because there was at least prima facie preliminary evidence that there might have been some purposeful wrongdoing. What's the percentage out of 615 that they looked at? Less than 3%. That's less than half of the corruption level in provincial and municipal governments. And well, this government, <laughs> I'd say it's hovering around 50%. But that's just my guess, don't hold me. Um, the federal government, robo calls to impact elections, right? F-35, the real cost, the real millions of dollars not reported to Parliament because, heck, it's just Parliament, it's just the government of the people, in theory. The eight summit, what was that, gazebo gate or something like that? Faith Lake and all those things? And then there is Dev OJ, or ODA. <laughs> if we're going to have a discussion about the relationship and we have to locate where the problem is, let's put all of the facts on the table and identify the actual problem. 
not being able to manage your budget the way that INAC would like you to by preparing 238 reports per year on all of your funding, that's a capacity issue. And there are a few incidences where there are people who have tried to move that around. But if all you hear in the media, and I think of yourself as a community member, if all you hear in the media is that your chiefs are corrupt, you start to believe it. And there's a large number of community members who honestly believe their chief and council are all, all in pine and hog and they're all corrupt. That problem is becoming an increasing problem for us to have the conversation with anybody else. No corruption. Okay. So the average salary in Canada, anybody know? It's forty-six thousand dollars. The average salary for chiefs, thirty-six thousand dollars. How many chiefs make no salary? Thirty. How many MPs do you know that work for free? How many MPs do you know who voluntarily work for free? Chiefs manage the lives of their communities, everything. The same federal, provincial, municipal kind of responsibilities for $36,000. Some chiefs make more than $100,000. That's true. There's a small number of them that do. There's a large number of librarians in this country that make more than $100,000. If you want to make comparisons, librarians manage books, and I know they do other things, and that's important. Chiefs have to manage their communities. Think about these things and we have to have this conversation. But let's look at some of the other myths. First Nations get everything for free. That's the kind of free house I want to live in. Do you want to know the kind of free house that Stephen Harper lives in? Let's talk facts. And that's assuming, of course, that all First Nations people have a free house. And in actual fact, the minority get banned owned housing. The majority build their own houses, get loans, have ministerial guarantees, programs through the Canada Mortga Mortgage Housing Agency, or some other program. The majority. But there's lots of free houses in Canada, lots of social programs. Habitat for Humanity, a whole bunch of programs, but we never actually do the comparison. We talk about, well, First Nations get free health care. And so do Canadians. When we get a few extra things. We don't have to pay the extra 5% on our prescriptions. But given that we have a higher rate of ill health and disease and premature deaths because of the poverty imposed by these policies, hardly a good deal. You can have the 5% if you bring us up to the same standard as everybody. But there's more. Let's talk about the unfair Aboriginal and treaty rights in this country. It is unfair for Indigenous peoples to have rights that other Canadians don't. Because when we go fishing, we get run over by DFO police officers. Our traditional way of sustaining ourselves off country food so that we don't have diabetes, that's criminal. Every year, someone in my family, and I live and I have eight sisters and three brothers, so it's very likely. Someone gets arrested, charged, and their equipment <coughs> confiscated because they want to have a lease for the winter. But if you're, oh, say, Peter McKay, and you want to go fishing in a fishing lodge, you can have a free $32,000 helicopter ride to your fishing lodge, paid for by who? The taxpayers. Let's get our priorities straight here. This is not a country without enough money. This is not a country who is imposing austerity and making for everyone to work. This is a country who is playing a shell game with funding, making sure the people in power get what they want and need, and lots of other people in Canada don't. Not just Indigenous peoples. Let's talk about the free services. Another thing I hear is, well, they don't have to pay for the water services. Well, what a deal that is. Let's ask people in Kesheshawan how they feel when their children end up with diseases simply because of contaminated water. 
or in Pitcantico, who have the highest rate of suicides in this country because they don't have health services, or Attawapiskat because they're living in shacks. But there's a way to make money off of this. Bruce Carson, Stephen Harper, and all of his other uh, friends decided to form a water company so that they could literally make hundreds of millions of dollars saving us from our water problems which they created. Still ongoing. So when you talk about people getting everything for free, when you talk about who gets what, let's put all the facts on the table. Because to my mind, the status quo, what we're doing now, the relationship that we're in now is killing our people. It's killing our people 500 years ago, killing our people 200 years ago, killing our people today. It's a vicious circle that the Canadian Journal of Public Health calls apartheid in Canada because of the purposeful nature of the chronic underfunding of essential services. Not, I'm not talking education or economic development. I'm talking water, food, heat and housing, the kinds of things that you can't essentially live without. You've got chronic underfunding, so the feds control it all, chronic underfunding, leads to what? Unsafe water, no sewer, crowded homes, which leads to, of course, food and water insecurity. You have less of an education, less of an income, because if you're so busy trying to feed your kids, kind of hard to concentrate in school or get to school. <coughs> We could ask Shannon Kostashev, if she were not deceased, about what it means when you have to drive somewhere else to go to school and you don't have enough food to eat and you don't have a school in your community. Leads to poor health, kids in care, more crime, violence, and despair. That's all in the Canadian Journal of Public Health, the American Medical Association journals, a hundred medical journals, world-renowned international scientists have all been able to prove these direct links. That, of course, leads to early death from disease. The American Medical Association, in conjunction with some of the research done by the Canadian, um, Canadian Medical Association, has shown that indigenous peoples and other peoples who live in extreme poverty, so think of certain minorities, die more preventable premature deaths from chronic underfunding of essential services than heart attack, stroke, and lung disease, the top three killers of everybody else. 100% preventable. Tens of thousands of people in Canada and the US. I wasn't just saying the status quo is killing our people, because it actually is. You can predict with pretty good certainty every year how many of our people are going to die. What a horrible for indigenous peoples to be in. And that's not everybody. There are some communities who are doing quite well. The majority, though, are not. 123 are in crisis mode. Multiple overlapping crises. How many does it take before we recognize it as a crisis? Attawapas got left for a good month. What about everybody else? I could go on and on, but I think I'll probably get my time right now. And I tend to go on there. But the policy, Indian policy in Canada has led to land possession, decimated populations, institutional abuse, intergenerational trauma, and in case you don't know who that is, that's why grandma is traumatized, <coughs> so is mom, so is baby. Poverty, depression, health, hopelessness, suicide, and premature death. Okay, now you know what the it is. Talk about the relationship. How do we have this conversation? How do we move forward? Because we know what the problems are. Indigenous peoples are bitterly aware of what the problems are. How do we move forward? What is the solution? Where do we go from here? How do we have a good treaty relationship? The kind that we want to. Well, we have to know the history. We have to show enough respect to know the history of Indigenous peoples. That's the start of any relationship. He would never go out with a guy in a billion years and all he did was talk about himself. Right? He should know at least a little bit about you. Okay? So we're in a relationship where one side
side, for the most part, doesn't know where we're coming from. Why is that student in class so angry every time the issue of residential schools comes up or treaties? Why are Indigenous scholars angry? Why do I go on huge rants? How do you understand where it is that we're coming from so that we can have this discussion? Well, know your history, the facts, all of them you get from the norm. Open your eyes to the current realities. <coughs> Don't be willfully blind to what's happening. Be respectful allies and take some ownership. Because anyone who says, I only immigrated to Canada yesterday, I have no openness, is kidding themselves. The fact that you get to immigrate to Canada is because you're on indigenous lands and territories. And another government who took those lands is making decisions over our territories. Not to say that we wouldn't have let other people in as indigenous people, but it's because we're not the ones making those decisions. The fact that that dispossession allows other people to come here and enjoy our land for resources and jobs and benefits and services, all paid for by our land. This country couldn't exist. No nation can exist without our territory. It's the heart of any nation. It's the heart of our nations, too. But it's been taken. And we need to do something about that. We have important treaty relationships, trade relationships. We're intermarried. We work together. We go to school together. These are really important relationships to foster. I think we should put some time and effort and energy into fostering those relationships. If you can only think in economic terms, and I can't because I'm a lawyer, but let's just pretend there's some economists here. If you don't buy all the heartfelt stuff about what we should do for so long, here's what the economics <coughs> say. It costs more to keep indigenous peoples in poverty than it does to make a minor investment that would bring us up to the same level as Canadians. Take, for example, one year in a federal prison costs $100,000. Four year university degree, horribly underfunded by INA, $60,000. So I can help an indigenous person go to university, get a degree, and their chances of getting a job and supporting their families and contributing to their nation as native citizens rise exponentially just from that one investment in education. Never mind what would happen in health. But the money for health is geared towards anesthetizing indigenous peoples. They will throw tons of money into Oxycontin and a whole host of painkillers. And look at the problems we have today. Instead of addressing the root causes, why the heck do we have diabetes? Well, I get thrown in jail every time I go hunting. We have to reconcile all of this mess. And it's hard, and it's huge, and it's overwhelming, but it can be done. And it's worth being done. Wow, wouldn't we like to be the best country in the world again? And it be real this time? That we can actually say we have a strong partnership? Talk to me Thank you. 
uniquely situated to change all of this discussion. You have conferences, lectures, special guests, extra special guests, <laughs> community-based activities, you have research, publications, you're in the media, academics are quoted all over the place. Wow, if we actually started putting the facts out there collectively, wow, if every single drop in school, and I don't just mean the native studies teachers, because there's something called traditional indigenous knowledge, and it's not just dancing and singing, it's math, it's astronomy, it's science, it's geology, it's environmental science. Imagine if every single professor in every single discipline knew enough to include that material in their courses or at least have the discussions. It would be huge, it would be monumental. Instead of academics like Tom Flanagan who say very often say that indigenous peoples are uncivilized. They're like primitive communists and that we're actually hurting them by allowing them to manage themselves. So they should all be assimilated and quote, assimilation is inevitable, kind of like Ford. That's a problem. That's a problem. And that's what we face. So now that we have more and more indigenous scholars, obviously indigenous scholars can't teach everyone. And everybody has a role to play. Think of all the students. Think of all the students went and hung out at the Aboriginal Center. It might be a bit crowded. <laughs> you may hate me after I leave. <laughs> but professors having open, respectful discussions. One of the things indigenous students most often say to me, I don't want to take your class because it's on indigenous politics or indigenous governance or whatever. But I'm so sick and tired of being the one in class who always has to put my hand up where all the other students turn around and it's a free for all on that one student. So I assure them, don't worry, in my class, it's a free for all of me on all the students. <laughs> um, but that's not the responsibility of indigenous students to bear. We're forced to be experts on everything. I should know everything. So, Anishinaabe, eh? I don't know, I'm Mi'kmaq. <laughs> well, I can't talk to you about Anishinaabe creation stories. I can't talk to you about the Mohawk position on land claims. Well, except for what I know legally, but I can't tell you, I can't speak on their behalf. There's so much that we need to change in our classes. The fact that you're having me here does, and talking about these issues, that's that's great. Instead of having, say, the Minister of Indian Affairs standing here, talking to you about economic development in Aboriginal communities. And how all of these funding cuts are no big deal because the people who are going to be funding First Nations in the future, people like Enbridge. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> it seems like a fiction. It's like a really bad comedy. But honestly, this is what was on ABCN. Saying, well, they can just get the money from Enbridge, yeah. After they give all of their territory up. Or, all of the other people who think they can save us. You know, just privatize all reserves. Just break up reserves. Individual parcels. to all be filthy rich. That'll work. population lives off reserve. Or maybe it's only four people who have certificates of possession. Some reserves are divided by only four certificates of possession. So four people have be simple? What about everybody else? Those are the kinds of things that are very problematic that universities can help change, can help change the dialogue. The most important thing to me though, however, is Resist savior syndrome at all costs. Do not be like these people. <laughs> this is like these indigenous people. <laughs> One of them is around here somewhere and they look very scary. Do not. And, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a natural inclination of human beings. I learned all about Latin American politics. Now I think I know everything that's just happening in Latin America. This person shouldn't be doing this, and that person shouldn't be doing that. I should have been paying attention to the timekeeper. I probably ought to find. Yeah, anyway, I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs>
form, <coughs> they do not exchange their ideas of how to fix us. Because every time that happens, we suffer greatly. Rob Clark wants to uh, repeal the Indian Act. Why? To better the lives of indigenous people. Why really? Because repealing the Indian Act eliminates Section 9124 of Producer Indian eliminates all of the authority mechanisms by which Indian Affairs funds First Nations communities, and they in an instant can say, well, we can't fund you. And that's just like one of the many things that that would do. Not to say that the Indian Act's good, it sucks. But it's up to us to decide when and how we replace it and with what. Well, that guy <coughs> just wants to assimilate us all. That, oh, we should be aspiring to mortgages and debt and cars. Yes, okay, one second. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Story is, and actually, I should just get you to recount it. 